Hello and welcome to our Monday lecture. I hope you're all uh, good and ready to go for another week. Um, oops, where's my keyboard? There we are. Uh, so let's start off with a bit of admin. Um, and uh, there are a few things to talk through. First of all, with assignment one, um, I want you to be very careful about checking the deadline. It's on the web page. It's very clear on the web page. I've also posted stuff on Piazza to um, to let you know that's going on there. Um, and uh, there's also uh, at the end of Friday's lecture. Let me just go to the web page and show you. Um, one of the things I did in was um, add on the um, web page at the end of the lecture on Friday. I went through a whole bunch of issues with the assignment. Um, just just stepping through a bunch of the things in the first few tasks. Um, this is just for those of you who are interested in getting a little bit more assistance there. And you can see it right here. If you click on this link here, um, and it's also, I've also posted a link to Piazza, but in that, that link there, um, if you just start here, we'll go to YouTube. It, it, it just walks through for about mm, 15 minutes, going through some step-by-step, -step, going through a bunch of stuff in the, um, in the assignment. Um, so make sure you take a look at that. And, um, Make sure you also make use of Piazza and one-to-one -one consultations. Remember, for those of you who don't know, we have one-to-one -one consultations. Let me also go back to the web page, jumping around a bit here. Uh, go to help uh, here. One-to-one -one consultations. They're on every weekday from 5 until 6 p.m. Uh, Australian Eastern time. Okay, so please make sure you use that. That allows you to have a one-to-one -one consultation with someone. Um, so if you're having issues with the assignment, please avail yourself of that. Um, don't forget the way the assignment works is you have to push stuff uh, to Git uh, to, uh, in GitLab, and uh, okay, apparently MS Stream is not started. I thought I did start that. My goodness, start event. I'm sorry. The the, the dialogue came came up after I'd uh, already begun. Thanks, uh, Leo, for pointing that out. MS Streams is very clunky compared to the others. <laughs> anyway, it's good. It's all. I believe it's all going now. Um, and I can see most people are watching on Twitch and YouTube. All right. Um, sorry for the interruption. Uh, all right. So the way it's going to work is you push stuff to to Git, and you the CI will tell you how you're going. Okay. The CI will tell you how you're going, and um, and uh, I really strongly encourage you to do that. ASAP. Do it, do it tonight. Do it today. Okay. Because the point is, if you have some silly little issue with your contribution statement, with your originality statement, or something like that, you want to sort it out at the beginning of the week. You don't want to be sorting out five minutes before the deadline. Okay. Because the deadline is absolute. All right. So if, if you miss the deadline, you miss the deadline. So sort out all that crap beforehand. Make sure by the end of Thursday, you've got something reasonable um, up um, pushed to uh, GitLab and it's passing some tests. And once you're in that position, then you just incrementally improve it. Okay. If you make a complete mess of things, say you say uh, on 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 Thursday night you get like two thirds of the assignment working, it's passing the CI, it's all good. Then on Friday morning, right before the deadline, you go and screw it all up accidentally. Okay. Just say that happens. Don't panic. Okay. We will go backwards in time. We won't go forwards in time. We won't let you, we won't extend the deadline. But if you have a complete disaster, you can send a private message to your to your um, tutor and say, hey, something bad went wrong. I did this commit right before the deadline. I couldn't unravel it. Can you please mark me on the stuff I committed on Thursday night or something like that? No problem at all. Okay. This is why it's so important to make sure you push regularly. And so if you do make a mess of things, we can go back in time. No problem. All right. Um, when it's done, the, the obviously the um, the assignment is marked uh, by auto grading, but it's also marked by your tutor. Okay, so your tutor will get a machine marked part, which says which which test you passed and so forth, and uh, they're also going to look at it. Okay, um, of course we use plagiarism detection in this course. Um, uh, so please, 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 please don't do the dumb thing. If you're under pressure, remember the assignment is redeemable. So if you feel like, oh my god, I don't know if I'm going to be able to um, get this assignment done, um, and then there's this temptation to do something foolish. Don't do it, okay? The assignment is redeemable. Don't fall for that temptation. Far, far better to redeem it with your exam than to um, uh, do something foolish and find yourself in a situation where you end up with academic misconduct on your academic transcript, which will scar you for the rest of your career. Okay, don't, don't, don't go there. All right, um, I hope I've made that point really clear. Um, with a class this size, unfortunately, there's always some people who are not listening or don't get it. Um, so for those of you who do get it, my apologies for saying this so many times. Um, all right, another thing, uh, feedback. I really want to hear from you. I've been teaching this course now for about eight years. 
every year I try to make it better. This year we got thrown a curveball with COVID. So a bunch of stuff I wanted to improve on the course from last year just, just got scattered to the wind. Um, on, and, and instead I got to deal with new wonderful things like streaming and, uh, and all sorts of um, um, online labs and all sorts of crazy stuff like that, which I'd never expected to do. So, um, but I do try really hard to make this class one that you're going to enjoy that you feel a lot of satisfaction from, okay? Um, I want to hear from you. Um, and the best way to hear from me, uh, from you is for you to talk directly to me. Okay. And the best way to do that is, uh, through a private message on Piazza. Um, and, but I get that sometimes you may feel uneasy doing that. And if that's the case, then you should, uh, talk to your student reps. We only have, uh, the student reps haven't been properly announced yet. I know two of them kind of, uh, were very eager and, uh, sent messages on Piazza, but they haven't actually been officially announced yet. I haven't actually got an official email saying who the student reps are. So I only know the two who announced themselves on, on Piazza, but as soon as they're up, I'm going to put them on the web, web page. I always do. I have a great relationship with my student reps and I uh, think it's really important. If you look on the rep, web page down here, this is what I have to say about class reps. They're incredibly important. And in fact, just by a terrific coincidence, if you look here on the webpage and look just above, you see Leo, he's actually helping run the lecture right this very minute. Leo was the class rep last year. Okay, he was a class rep for 1140, I think. And um, and some of you might be amazed to see he's now a tutor. One year later, he's a tutor, okay? Um, being a class rep is really important. I take the class rep uh, role very, very seriously. I like to engage my class reps, um, but make sure that you understand they're not, a, they're not a substitute for providing feedback to your, to your lecturer, okay? You've got to provide feedback to me directly. If you can't, then you need to tell your class rep why you felt like you couldn't talk to me, okay? Because I see that as a problem. If you feel like you can't give me feedback, then I'm like, what's going on here? You should be able to give me feedback, okay? Um, anyway, your class reps will be great. Um, and as soon as they're, um, announced, I will, um, and as soon as they've given me photos, etc., I'll put them down here, just like the tutors are, are there. And so you can know who they are and know how to contact them. Okay. Class reps are an important part of our class and congrats to those who have already found out that they're class reps and congrats to whoever is about to find out. <laughs> Um, make sure you use Piazza. Uh, there's been some discussion on the, um, there's always discussion about um, what constitutes academic misconduct and so forth and so on. Look, there's, there, there, there is, I'm trying to give you quite a few different guidelines. Um, one of the, uh, qu quite a few different ways of looking at the guidelines. The guidelines are clear. They're on the, they're on the, they're on the university webpage. But, um, but, uh, but one very simple litmus test that I, that I said in an answer to a question last night was, um, if you feel like you're telling someone something that you wouldn't be prepared to write publicly on Piazza, you're probably making a mistake, okay? So ask yourself that question. Ask yourself the question, is what I'm telling this person here something I'd be prepared to do in public on the Piazza? And if the answer is no, then I would suggest back off very, very fast because the consequences of doing something inappropriate are significant, both for the person providing the help and the person receiving the help, okay? And that's really clear in the ANU rules. That's not a Steve thing. That's an ANU rules thing, okay? And um, and I take that seriously, all right? So following up that question, um, so there's there's a corollary to that, and that is to think very careful about the forums in which you, you're getting help, okay? The best forums to getting help are public forums. There's many reasons for that. If someone's giving you bad help, the, the, one of the nice things about Piazza is the tutors and myself will upvote or you know will endorse things that are good advice. Okay, and you can also see people have got badges and they're saying that they're giving good advice. All right, so that's one that's one great reason for using Piazza. The other one is if there's a mistake in the assignment, right? And there there often are. These are very very complex. Um, uh, they uh. Yeah, if, if there's a mistake in the assignment, then um, I need to know straight away, right? And so sometimes your questions are like, oh, this doesn't seem to make sense, okay? And making that visible to me is really, really useful, okay? So by all means, um, have your, your your own chat channels and stuff. That's fine. The, the, the two things you need to be careful of. Make sure that you don't, do any, you don't fall into the slip down the slippery path of accidentally transmitting too much information because that won't end well. And the other one is as a collectively, as a group, make sure you make sure behavior on those channels is appropriate. Okay, that's one thing we do on Piazza. If someone goes rogue, we shut that down very, very quickly. If you've got your own channel, make sure someone responsible is taking care of that. We don't want anyone in this class um, being subject to un inappropriate behavior on any channel, okay? So good luck and, and, and good good on you for doing that. I know it's really hard in COVID. Um, in, in, in the regular times, people would be gathering in common rooms and stuff like that to have these conversations. Um, and so it's, it's totally a good idea to have these other forums that you guys run. That's that I've got no problem with that at all, but make sure you use them wisely and, and be very, very careful about things like academic misconduct. Um, 
uh, Darren asks, why can't we share the, the code of homework since they're not marked? Um, there's a basic principle there, a very basic principle. And I explained this somewhere. I'm sure I've explained this before. Um, I, um, uh, <laughs> so I'm reading about the rubber duck. Um, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the basic principle, uh, so where were we? The homework thing, the basic principle is we do not want to deprive people of learning opportunities. That's a very important principle. Okay. I think I say it on the Piazza on the, on how to use Piazza. Okay. That's the thing. That's where I say it, right? It's a very important principle. I go to extraordinary lengths to provide you guys with a whole bunch of learning opportunities. If someone then goes and blats out the answer, you all know very well that if you've got a question and the answer's right beside it, you're not going to learn very much, right? You will not learn. Okay. You need to be able to work through a problem uh, without the answer right in front of you. If you work through a problem with the answer right in front of you, your learning's gone, okay? The way to do it is to work through the problem. By all means, go and talk to your friends about the homework questions. There's no academic in, uh, integrity question near about getting help from your, your friends. It's perfectly okay, all right? So if you don't understand how one of the homework questions works, then by all means, ask your friend. Better still ask it on Piazza, right? There's no problem at all. But don't share your code. Don't post your code to Piazza. And the reason is really simple. We don't want to deprive all the other 400, 420 members of the class of the opportunity to learn. And that's what happens the instant you put a solution out on the uh, on Piazza or any public medium. If you put a solution out there, whether it be for homework, for a lab, or for an assignment, for any of those, as innocently as you might be doing it, if you're putting the solution out there, you're depriving others of the opportunity to learn. That's the principle. That's the reason why we don't do it, okay? Hopefully that's answered Darren's question. Um, what else? I think we're about done with admin. Um, unless anyone has another question, please feel free to ask it on the chat. Sometimes question I want to ask doesn't make sense without sharing a small amount of code. Yeah, this is an interesting question. Uh, good, good point, Darren. Um, uh, you need to learn then to abstract your question in a way that um, exposes the issue without divulging all the details. This is something we have to do all the time as professionals. When, if, if and when you move into a professional career in this area, we do this all the time. Does anyone know when we do this? Um, someone's got a suggestion, chat channel I was referencing last night. Yep, um, yep, it's a good community. That's no, no worries at all. I'm not suggesting otherwise, okay, that's great. Um, uh, but uh, my question to, to everyone on the, on the chat, does anyone know a situation where professionals have to do what Darren's asking about? That is to basically say something without delivering all the, the gory details. The answer is in bug reporting, okay? We don't want you, if you're reporting a bug on, on some open source software I'm writing or some closed source software I'm writing, if you're reporting a bug, I need you to go and distill it down to the most precise precise way of saying it, okay? Yeah, also code reviews and uh, communicating with non-tech people. Not so much code reviews because there you're walking someone through your code. But but when, you, when you're when you when you're reporting a bug, you've got to distill the thing down and you don't give them the whole um, kit and caboodle. What you do is you work out a way of re reproducing that bug that just has some abstracted lines of code here, okay? So it is an interesting problem. How do you say what your problem is without just like splatting out the code? The lazy way, of course, is just to splat out and say, hey, I've got a bugger, this this doesn't work, right? That's that, that's not helpful to you and it's not helpful to the rest of us, okay? So it's actually an art and it's, it's, a, it's a really good question, Darren. Um, um, and uh, someone says you don't want to you don't want to give away intellectual property. That's actually right. I uh, one of my uh, mates from my PhD days, Andrew Tridgell, um, was in this very very complex um, lawsuit around um, the Linux kernel, and um, uh, it's it's actually a very famous lawsuit. But um, that th that involved being able to compare two source code trees with millions of lines of code without anyone actually seeing both at the same time. That is a really hard problem. And, and and you might think I'm saying something that's impossible. It's not impossible at all. There's, there's, there are cryptographic solutions to this and they developed them, which allowed them to have two parties compare whether or not their source codes were stolen from each other without actually looking at each other's code. Interesting problem. That's a story for another day. But yeah, this is this is um, an interesting point. And someone writes, uh, gives a stack overflow, minimal reproducible, blah, blah, blah. This sounds great. Um, by the way, Stack Overflow is a resource I use nearly every day. Stack Overflow is a great resource very often, okay? So I highly recommend it. I do a lot of coding and Stack Resource is one of my go-tos. All right, I think with that, we better move on. Um, any last questions? If anyone has any last questions on anything administrative, now's your time to shoot. Oh, look, one last thing, the big picture thing I want to say on, on admin. I told you at the, oh, jump to the, the, the full screen view. I told you at the start of the semester, this course starts fast. I guess most of you by now have realized what I meant by that, okay? It's a really fast start in this course, okay? Why? Because we're not teaching Java in this course. If I was teaching Java, you, you, you do the last bits of Java in, in week uh, 12 or whatever, right? But no, you, got, you guys are gonna be nearly finished with Java in a few weeks. 
Why? Because this course isn't about teaching Java. This course is about building software and we just happen to be using Java as a tool. To do that, we have to move really fast at the beginning and get you up to speed. And how do I do it? Well, I repeat things many, many times. So you might be thinking, my God, he's gone through so much stuff, I don't follow any of it. Don't panic, okay? Two things to, to, to remember. One, I'm gonna be repeating things again and again, and like the violin example I gave in the very first lecture, you're gonna get practice, and you're gonna practice thing, these things again and again, and you're gonna get much better at it over time, okay? That's one thing. Second of all, the early assessments are redeemable, and they're redeemable for a really good reason, okay? It means that if if, if, if you're finding it difficult, um, or if you trip over things, or if things are stressing you out too much, don't worry, you can redeem those marks later, okay? So, if you're feeling under pressure right now, just calm down a little bit, it's not so bad. Things are redeemable, we know it's a fast start, things are gonna feel a lot better later in semester because you've knuckled down now and got a lot under your belt, all right? so. Bear with us, persevere, and um, let's. And now let's move on with the next part of the lecture. All right, um, what we're doing now is um, nested classes. So nested classes is a, a concept in um, the Java offers that allows you to put, as the name implies, uh, classes inside classes, just like a Matryoshka doll. All right, so uh, what is it? A, nest, a class may be defined within another class, okay? Incidentally, someone, gave me a uh, ran into a big problem um and that they, they raised with me um where they had they're getting a lot of errors in their code um and it turned out what had happened is they declared methods inside methods you can't do that in java you can put a class inside a class but you can't put a method within a method okay so each method is a distinct block of code um classes can be nested methods cannot be met, uh, nested all right, um, um, someone asked about the Java Standard Library. I've actually answered that a lot of times. You don't need to put stuff that's in the Java Standard Library or stuff I've mentioned in lectures and you, you don't need to put that in your originality statement. Okay, um, static, okay. So there are two ways you can nest a class in uh, Java. Um, one is called a statically nested class. And uh, to do that, we it's very similar to the other type except we use the word static. Um, the other is called an inner class. And I'll just quickly explain the difference. A static nested class is a really, really simple idea. Um, uh, all it does is basically take two classes, and hopefully you've learned by now, and you've watched me make mistakes in coding, that the name of the class has to match the name of the file in Java. Okay, it's just one of the rules in Java, that you've got to have a, have a class name has to match the name of the file, all right? Now, a static class is the one exception to that. You can put an, uh, a class nested inside of another one. The um, file name has to match the name of the uh, outer class, but the inner class can sit inside there. Why would you want to do that? Anyone? Can anyone suggest why you might want to want, want to do that? Well, I get myself a sip of co a bit more caffeine. Why might you want to put a class inside of another class? Okay, uh, maybe you guys need some coffee too. <laughs> the reason it's Monday morning. Um, Encapsulation, fantastic, great, Angus, yes, very good, okay. Uh, and for binary search trees, yeah, we I think we do use those for our binary search trees, but but yeah, encap encapsulation, no, not about inheritance, uh, it, it can relate to inheritance, but that's not the reason. Um, data abstraction and encapsulation are the two big things, and uh, Adam and Angus already hit on that. Um, and, and, and it's basically a matter of hiding stuff, right? If, uh, if, if this particular class is really only used in a in this, with, by this other class, why not just tuck it away inside of that one just to keep it neat and tidy rather than proliferate lots and lots of itty bitty classes everywhere, okay? So it's just a matter of tidiness. That's all it's about, okay? The static nested class is just a matter of tidiness. We're just pack putting it in there because we don't really want to mess up, have lots of files everywhere with little itty bitty classes. And I could have used them more with assignment one. I deliberately didn't because I didn't want to expose you to a whole lot of that stuff. Um, in your first assignment. However, does anyone notice a place where we've already seen nested classes? I didn't actually teach it to you, but I put it under your nose a little bit. Anyone notice? It's in the GUI for the assignment, which you're, which you're very welcome to look through because you're gonna use that as examples for assignment two, okay? We provide all that stuff in the GUI, in the GUI for uh, the assignment so that you can um, see how we build the GUI and you can use that as, a, as a, something of a template for assignment two. But if you look in there, you'll find nested classes, okay? So take a look in there at some point and you can see the nested classes inside of the game uh, GUI class. All right, so, uh, just to repeat, a static nested class behaves as if it was declared somewhere else, but happens to be put into a single file. That's all, all right? Inner classes are more interesting. They're a very subtle difference in terms of the way you write them. You just don't have the static keyword. 
but it means that you can have direct access to the instance fields and its members of its enclosing class. And the assumption is that every time you create one of this class, you're also creating exactly one of this class, which means that this one can see um, all of its members of its enclosing class. Okay, so that sounds strange. Don't worry, we're going to work through an example very soon where it should become more obvious exactly what I mean. Okay. All right, mini quiz time. I'll publish the quiz. There we go. All right, time to uh, get into some coding now. And new Java class, J08 dot, uh, what am I gonna call it? I'm gonna call it lecture theory. This is really <laughs> a little bit ironic because uh, unfortunately, sadly, this, the, this example um, is not appropriate this year. But normally we meet in a lecture theater. Okay, there we go. Yep, add that to get. All right. So we normally when we run a class, we meet in a lecture theater. And I'm just going to use this very, very contrived example. Some of my examples are pretty contrived. This is a pretty contrived example. Um, and I'm just going to use this to help motivate um, why, um, how, how we could use it in a class. It is a little bit silly, but anyway, let's get to it. So we're going to have a name for our lecture theater. So normally when we meet in, some of you people have never been to the campus. Uh, no, most of you should have been to the campus at the start of uh, semester one. Some of you have never been to the campus, okay? And if you've never been to the campus, we have lecture theaters and have names, all right? And that's where we normally meet. And normally that's how I give my classes into in, in a room with uh, lots of you sitting in, in, in seats, physical seats in the same room. Okay, and one of the features, one of the things I care about is uh, is the projector in the room. Okay, the projector, the projector is, uh, you know, a piece of equipment, but it, um, the, back in the old days at least, it really mattered to me whether or not it was a HD projector or not because I needed HD in order to um, do this sort of live coding um, um, because I needed more resolution on the screen. So I cared about that. So knowing what sort of projectors in lecture theater is actually kind of a vaguely important thing. So now string, let's see if I can type properly, string name. So let's give the lecture theater a name. It, it, on campus, every lecture theater has a name. A lot of them are really boring, but, um, um, and, and we're going to give every lecture theater a projector. Okay. So this is very boring. We haven't defined that class notice, which is why IntelliJ is saying, is screaming at us in red saying, Hey, I don't know what this projector thing is. So let's just make one. All right. We'll make a class here called projector. And it's going to be on the VR lectures. Okay. We'll see what we can do. Rest in peace lecture theaters. It's interesting. It'll be interesting to see how you guys feel at the end of the semester about, about, uh, uh, real world lectures versus uh, streamed lectures. I've got mixed feelings. I'm, I, I, it's not as bad as I thought it would be. Although I tell you what, the cognitive load of doing live coding and streaming is something else. Um, keeps me on my toes. <laughs> All right, um, string model. So we've got some model name, you know, like a Panasonic or whatever it might be, right? Or a Hitachi. And then we've got a Boolean, um, which is gonna tell us whether it's a HD projector. Okay, I care about this because I don't want a low res projector if I'm gonna do coding. And then your pro projector is going to want to say what room it belongs to. Okay, this particular projector is in that room. So we're going to have a, a two directional relationship. So, so the theater will say, I've got this projector in it. And the projector will say, hey, I've got, I'm in this theater. Um, and of course, in principle, there could be more than one projector in the theater. But for now, let's just assume it's one to one. Private um, um, lecture, the lecture theater um, room. Okay, so your projector has those three fields and then uh, we want to make ourselves a constructor um projector and uh, string model uh uh boolean hd um lecture theater room like that and then we just fill in the boilerplate here you should be familiar with this now we're going to make this dot model equal the one that's passed as a parameter there's two models here one is the parameter model, which is in gray up there. Now it's black and the the one that's the field of this particular projector, which is in purple. Okay, this dot HD equals HD and this dot room equals room. There we go. Um, there we go. And then, oops, keyboard issue again, getting ourselves. Uh, okay, now what we're gonna do is, uh, yeah, let's just do ourselves a little um, two string method. Public, <laughs> it can't be private, public string to string like that. 
You guys should be familiar with this. It's the concept of overriding. That little arrow there will take us to our parents uh, the implementation of ToString, which will be all the way up in object. And all I, need, all I need to do there was just hover the mouse over it with IntelliJ and it, it, it indicated that this ToString overrides the one provided by our parent in Java Lang object. All right, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, say um, return um, and then model um, and then we'll say the model, oops, oops, plus model like that. And then um, is, and then mm, let's, let's just do this a little bit fancy. We'll say uh, something, I'm just gonna do it, do this here. If it's not HD, well, we'll say if it's HD, this is a shorthand way of doing an if statement in Java, by the way. If it's HD, we'll say nothing. Otherwise we'll say not like that. All right, this is a, a little bit of wacky wacky Java there, which is writing a little expression that will have empty string if the thing is HD, and I'll have the word not and a space if it's not HD, all right? So then we write HD. So I'll either, so what that's gonna do is it's either gonna print out that it's HD or it is not HD. And then um, we'll say um, in, in room, and then we'll have a plus sign here and say uh, room dot name. There we go. So that will print out for this projector what its model is, and it'll say whether it's HD or not, and then it'll say what room it's in. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. So why are we showing this shown early? Because it's a like a dirty little trick. It's uh, it's per perfectly legitimate part of Java, and it's it's in a lot of languages like Java. Like it comes from C, and it's just a very shorthand way of writing an if statement. So there's your condition there. It's a boolean HD. There's the moral equivalent of the if statement, and then the colon separates the two cases. That one there is an empty string. And that one there is a string with some stuff in it. So so basically, what we're doing is we're we're gonna give ourselves an empty string if HD is true, and that string there if HD is not true, all right? And the last thing we're gonna do is out of politeness, um, out of uh, protocol, we're gonna point out this is overridden, this is overriding the parent one, okay? It's good practice. All right, so we're overriding our parents uh, to string method. All right, now we've done that. Um, now what we want to do is, we've got ourselves a room, we've got ourselves a projector. What we're gonna do now is we're going to um, write a very simple little class that uses this stuff. So new Java class, we'll call it nesting because we're demonstrating nesting here, nesting like that. And add it to git, yep, okay. And then what we're gonna do is uh, like that. Uh, we'll say uh, lecture theatre a equals new lecture theatre, and I say with much sadness here um, m c h. That's the lecture theatre I used to use. Ah, I haven't written the constructor for a lecture theatre yet. Oh, all right. I need to do that. All right, I'll do that. It'll just take me a second. A little tiny bit of boilerplate here, and we probably want a two-string method there as well. All right, so let's just quickly pump that out. Public. Uh, will it do it for us? No, um, I think I can. I can do this, but I, I don't remember the uh, public uh, lecture theater um, string name. Oh, man, my typing name string model, um, and then boolean hd like that, and then we'll just say uh, um, this. Um, dot name equals name, so that's the name of the lecture theater, and this dot projector equals new projector. So we're gonna create a new projector for this room. So it's saying, someone's saying, here's your lecture theater, and it's got this kind of projector in it with that, and it's HD, and then we're gonna make ourselves a projector object. I'm gonna say the model name, and whether it's HD, and now what we need to do is we need to refer to the room that the projector is in. So what room, alt insert, oh very good, thank you, James. Um, uh, we need to um, refer to what uh, room the projector is in. Can anyone tell us what room is the projector in? What do I write here? Yeah, very good, yeah, exactly, James. Uh, it's this, okay? We wanna to refer to ourselves because the projector is in the room um, that we're constructing right here. So we need to write this. Okay, so that is self-referential saying, it's like saying me, all right, me, right? This is, 
you know, language like Java is like saying me. So, so you know, my name is that name. My projector is this projector here. And then when you say to the projector, which room it's in, it's like me, okay, this one. All right, that's the language, okay? That's the language you use. And so that's how we use the this keyword. This keyword is really important, okay? Um, now what we're gonna do is, incidentally, those of you talking about live lectures and, and uh, streaming and stuff, one thing that is really cool that I'm watching as you as, as, I, as I write here is you're having a really good discussion here, which I don't think would be very easy to do um, without the um, chat, um, uh, which is terrific. So uh, it's normally a lot more muted. So I actually quite like that. So we're gonna write a string here, we're gonna produce a string. And I noticed someone out of the corner of my eye, I noticed someone was concerned that there was an extra space. Um, and I'm gonna go back and check that to see if they're right. They probably are right. I probably made a mistake there. All right, save that. Now let's just go back. Someone was saying uh, in the projector here, is there an extra space? Yeah, there is, okay. Is, and then I've got a space before HD. So we wanna get rid of that space there. Well spotted, all right. Um, okay, all right. So now what we get back to this piece of code I was writing before when I suddenly realized I didn't have a constructor. We've written ourselves that constructor now. We've written the constructor for the lecture theater and, and we've given it the name. The name is um, Manning Clark uh, Hall. I think that's what M MCH was. That's where I taught last, last uh, when I taught this class last year. And let's just call it a Panasonic for no particularly good reason. And it's definitely HD in that hall. It's got a humongous screen. This screen's like, I don't know, 10 meters high. It's a very big screen and it's high res. So true. All right. Um, all right. So there we are. So um, now we'll print that out. This is very unexciting. Um, and the way we do, what I want to emphasize here is that we're not nesting yet. Okay. Some of you are thinking, isn't this about nesting? It is about nesting, but not yet. Okay. So far, I have not done nesting. We've got two classes, the projector and the lecture theater, and they're completely separate. In a minute, we're gonna nest them, okay? So what I'm gonna write here is two classes, and and then I will print out our um, plus A, and, and we'll, we'll print out what A is, okay? So we'll run this. So, so far, everything I've done, you should find pretty unremarkable, okay? I haven't done any nesting yet. Oh, and notice things are compiling and building down here. There we go, two classes. Uh, room MCH has a projector model Panasonic. It is <laughs> this is extra space before the HD. What have I done? All right, someone pointed that out. I still got it wrong. What do I do there uh, is HD. Yeah, there's a double space. This uh, there's lots lots of extra spaces there. So actually, what we're going to do is get rid of this space before that HD and add a space here after the not. That's the problem. All right, that's the right fix to the problem that someone else noted noticed. Okay, this is not very important, folks, but. Um, I'm just, there we go. Now it's nicely formatted. All right, so it's in room MCH. All good, okay? So um, there's nothing exciting so far. Nothing interesting at all. All we've done is create two class classes and they have a relationship between each other. They're both related. The lecture theater refers to the um, projector and the projector refers to the le lecture theater, okay? That's all we've done so far. What we're gonna do now is statically nest them. Static nesting is really simple. It's just slapping stuff into the one file, it's slapping more than one class into one file, simple as that. So what we're gonna do is we're going to um, create ourselves a new class. We're gonna do, do it really lazily because um, I'm pressed for time and you know really lazy. Um, and now we're gonna do this. We're gonna call it lecture theater um, static nested like that okay there it is let's see the static nested and we've just all we've done is duplicate okay nothing interesting yet all right um but what we're going to do now is we're going to get the projector and do the same thing first of all we're going to do this in two steps the first step will be um like this oh, hang on uh, sorry keyboard issues again projector um static nested okay so now we've got two classes still so that's not helpful right but it allows me to do the following um i can now go like this cut and go into here and just slap it in there like that okay now i said it was going to be static so i have to write the word static here okay 
All right, we're nearly there. Now I want to get rid of this one. This is just junk, right? It's got nothing in it. I was just using that to uh, get IntelliJ to help me do things quickly. So I'm going to cut that. Okay, Ooh, delete, sorry, backspace. There we go, what, do I want to delete? Yes, I do, get rid of it. Okay, gone. All right, so now what we've got here is everything in one class, okay? So we've got the original stuff down here, lecture theater static nested down here. And up here, you've got the projector static nested, the class declaration, see the word class, is inside the other class. That is a nested class, all right? Um, so now what we're gonna do, there's a few little details here. We wanna change this from being, so this is a lecture theater. So now the lecture theater, just for the sake of this example, we don't want it to have a projector inside it, we want it to have this guy, projector static nested, right? Like that. And then um, the projector, conversely, Instead of having a lecture theater inside of it, we want to have a lecture theater static nested like this. Uh, where is it? There. Okay. And there. Okay. So now, um, oh, here I'm going to change this. All I'm doing is patching everything up. So I'm just changing the names very, very simple mindedly. Okay. So all I've done now is I've said both of them are related to each other and they both have new names. They're both now called, they have the, the suffix static nested on them. Okay. So. Let's just see what I did. I changed it from having a projector to having a static nested projector. And I changed the, the static nested projector to have a static nested lecture theater. Okay. And I changed everything consistently all the way through. There we go. Should be good. Okay. So um, what you've seen there is very simple mindedly me just dumping the code from the projector into the class for the lecture theater. I haven't demonstrated it yet. Let's just go do that. So we'll do the same thing here. Just cut and paste in a really simple way. Like that, but now we're gonna do static. Oops, lecture theater static nested. There it is. And its constructor needs to be that, okay? And it's, we'll call it B for no good reason. Very unimaginative. Um, And we run this. And what do we see? Uh, hasn't run, there it's still running. Uh, okay, so what we see here is that's the, the thing we did before. Okay, now we see static nested and it's produced exactly the same output. Okay. Um, so um, someone asked a question, let me go back to this code. This is obviously creating a few questions. Let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger. There we go. That's the whole other thing, right? You can see it all now. Okay, so the question is, um, the the declaration of the class, it's just a static nested class. We're not making a static instance. It's just a statically nested class. That's all that keyword is meaning, okay? it's That qualifier is on the class declaration. And that's just saying it's a statically nested class, which is just, Java's own particular way of saying it's a class within a class with no particular relationship to the other class. Okay, no special relationship. We can put anything in there. And if I write static, then it means it's just some other class that happens to be put into the same file as this class. That's all that word static means. Uh, line 29. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Someone pointed out a typo there. Thank you. And you know, you're going to see me do a lot of typos. I'm, I'm not the best uh, to be over there too. There it is. Okay. I'm getting typing right when you're doing this sort of stuff is hard. And then I'm a terrible speller to start with. All right. So there we go. We've done that. Um, hopefully you can see all that we've done is this code here. I'll just make the spacing a little bit bigger. This code here is almost line for line, exactly the same as what you saw in that projector thing there, but it's been slapped in inside of this other class here. So we've nested this code inside of the other class. That's all we've done. All right, that's all we've done. And we've used the word static up here for this. That's just the way Java does it. But it, it, that's just Java's way of saying this particular class, this one here, has no particular, no special relationship with this one here. There's nothing special about it, their relationship at all. Okay, nothing special. It could be any class. There's no, there's no special relationship. That's what static nesting means. Okay. So we're not nested, we're using the code from the lecture theater and projector. Um, yeah, that's what I just did before, right? That, that was the first example was when they're not nested. Okay, here they're not nested, here they're nested. Okay. All right, now what I'm gonna do is um, do um, inner classes, which is the next version of this. So what we're gonna do is very, very similar. We're gonna um, do it through very simple code duplication. So I'm gonna copy and then I'm gonna paste. 
and we're going to make a new version, Lecture Theatre Inner, like this. And uh, Projector Inner as well. So copy and paste Projector Inner. Okay, so now we have, I'm going to add them to Git. Yep. Okay, so now we have this. And what we're going to do again is actually just cut and paste this class definition here into this one here, just like we did before. Okay, so now it's in there. This time we're not writing the word static there. Okay, so it's going to be an inner class rather than a nested class. And that gives it some special properties, which I'm going to demonstrate in a few moments. Let's just get rid of this one here. That's just dead code. We didn't really want that. I just did that as a hack to... Um... Okay, there it is, Lecture Theatre Inner. So now we have three versions of the Lecture Theatre. The regular Lecture Theatre, which goes with a regular projector. We've got a static nested Lecture Theatre, and we've got an inner Lecture Theatre. This one's not, not fi fixed yet. We need to do the same sort of fix up as we did before, so that... Um, this type here matches the type we're actually going to use in this example. Um, in a projector, where else have we got references to it? Okay, and then we're going to do the opposite here, so that in a projector refers to an inner lecture theater, like that. Um, all right, I think that we're done there. And now what we can do is add it to nesting and do the same thing all over again. So you, these are three equivalent ways of doing the same thing. Uh, inner, inner, oops, oops, you know, okay, inner, like that, and call this one C, and we'll say, um, what classes, inner class, and call it C. All right, so now we, we run it. We should just see three lines that are basically the same because they're all equivalent at this moment. I'm going to do something more, more interesting in a moment. Could I put the project class at the end of Lecture Theatre? Yeah, I can put it wherever I want in there as long as it's inside the curly braces, okay? So uh, now I need to make, make this bigger so you can see. There we go. Okay, so the three things behave exactly the same. So someone asked, can I put it? It doesn't matter where I put it. No, it doesn't matter where I put it. So let's just go here. Um, so we can just do this. What I can't do, uh, hang on, what happened? Oops, man, keyboard issues. All right, so I can do this, right? So just some, I think you're asking me this question here. Notice that I've deleted it. So now the red saying, hey, that thing's missing. So then that's that's fine, right? I can do that perfectly fine. What I can't do um, is put it out here because then it's actually not nested. Now I'm putting two separate classes. They're not nested, but they're separate in the same file. You cannot do that, okay? They've got to be in the same file. All right, so let's go back to where we were. We can paste them there if you want, okay? It makes no difference where in within the class you paste it, okay? So let's just put it back up where I had it. Put it up here, there you go. Again, folks, these are great questions. When you're doing this stuff yourself, the best way to find out, if you don't know the answer, I mean, I knew the answer, I've done this before, but uh, if you don't know the answer, just try it out and see what happens. I Meaning outside the bracket, I just did with outside the bracket, I guess you've seen that, right? So it's gotta be, it's gotta, it's gotta be within these brackets here. If you put it outside of there, it's not an inner class, okay? Uh, it's not a nested class is what I mean to say. Now, what we can do is because there's a one-to-one -one relationship here, that means that this can actually refer to the fields here. Okay, so what that means is um, we don't need to... Um, so, hang on, so what can we do? What are the examples here? We don't need to refer to the... Um, okay, this guy can refer to... Um, to the name, we don't actually have to say room.name, we just say name like this, okay? Because we're inside, because it's an inner class, not a static class, but an inner class, we're inside there, we can just say name because we can see that name value up there, okay? So that's one of the things we can do. Um, we don't need to refer to room anymore. You don't need to have that reference anymore because it's implicit, okay? So we don't need this anymore. The relationship is now implicit, okay? Because it's an inner class, so we can get rid of all of this stuff, okay? Get rid of that. 
All right, I think that's all I wanted to show you. So we've simplified. So now if you compare the, compare the inner class with the static nested class, you'll see that when the inner one does not need to um, refer to the lecture theater explicitly. Instead, it does it implicitly and can just use the, 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 um, the field name, which is a field of its parent. See that? So this name here is that name there. Okay, so the inner class can refer to its parent. That's because there's a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, yeah, it's 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 almost always better to use a getter. Someone asked about using getters for sure. Um, unfortunately, for the sake of doing things quickly uh, and making things clear at some level, often I don't necessarily always use the best coding practice in my classes. Like all this cutting and pasting I'm doing is really bad. Don't do that. But uh, it's the best way to um, explain it. I, I mean, I think it's probably the best way to explain it, even though it's um, not what... Uh, you should be doing at home. All right, so yes, like don't do this at home, folks, is I guess part of the message with some of this stuff. Um, is there any reason w you'd want to make it static? Yeah, yeah, because um, the static, the, the static nesting is useful because it's just tidiness, okay? There's no, there's no strong reason. So someone asked, why, why would you make it static if there's not, if, if you could, if you could make it inner? The thing is, the inner assumes that there's this one-to-one -one relationship, which there is in the example I gave you between the lecture theater and the projector, but there may not be, right? And if that's the case, you, you may just decide you want to put it in there for tidiness. That's the only reason to put it in there, okay? If you're just going to do static nesting, that really only buys you tidiness. That's all it's doing. So it's just, if you've got a really tiny little class that has a fairly strong relationship with this one, just put it in there for tidiness sake, okay? it um, That's the only reason why you do it, okay? Whereas with the inner class, uh, there's actually a much stronger relationship. And you saw that because you got rid of the reference to, to room because they're actually tightly linked, okay? So let's recap. Both of these things allow you to put one class inside of another. The static nested is really just used for tidiness because you decide you don't want to have an extra file with this class in it because it's really only used in this class perhaps. Um, and that's merely for tidiness, it doesn't do anything else. The inner class on the other hand is much richer. It actually allows the nested class to see its parents' fields, okay? And it, but it assumes a one-to-one -one relationship. All right, so with that, I think we're ready to move on. So let's do that. The next, uh, few, the next, next thing we're gonna do is look at interfaces um, and uh, so someone's asking another question, but it's scrolled off the edge of my screen. Um, if they have the same fields in their class, you can't. Okay, good question. What happens if the inner and the other class have the, have the same names? Then you've got a clash, okay? Um, I don't think, well, maybe you can, but that'd be a bad idea. <laughs> okay, but you can go and experiment with it. I'm, I'm kind of out of time, or if there's time at the end of the lecture, I can come back and do that. But you can just go and mess around with it and see what happens. But good, good question. What if? All right, now we're going to move on to interfaces. Uh, hopefully you can all remember... And I promised you I'm going to circle around. So I'm circling around again. I started right at the very beginning uh, talking about what an interface was. Can anyone, anyone remember what, I, what English language word I used to describe an interface? It's like what in, the, in, in English? An interface is like what? Anyone? Yeah, an interface is... I'll get, remind you of the examples I gave. It's, it's, a, it's the... Yeah, perfect. Someone said, it's a contract. Exactly. It's a contract. It's like a contract. It says, I promise you I can do the following behaviors, and then you enumerate the behaviors. It doesn't say anything about your actual inheritance relationship, okay? Um, so we're gonna, in a minute, we're going to look at animals and the relationship between a, um, uh, an animal, a uh, mammal, a human, a dog in a family tree. That's an inheritance relationship, okay? But um, interfaces aren't like that at all. Interfaces just says, I'm a thing that can go forwards. I'm a thing that can go backwards, okay? It's not a relationship to any other particular type. It's just saying, I have the capability to do this, okay? I offer that capability. It's a contract, okay? Um, all right, so uh, yeah, so it's so the example I use is like a contract. It's a contract that I'm gonna be able to deliver a certain service, all right? So uh, there you are. Uh, an interface can be thought of as a contract. A class which implements an interface must provide the, the specified functionality. Compared to a class, an interface, um, we use the interface keyword rather than the class keyword. Uh huh. Okay, so we use the interface keyword rather than the class keyword. Uh, you can't create an instance of an interface, okay? I can't create, the example I used in, before was a movable thing. Okay, so there's this notion of a movable thing. And I said, you know, an elephant is a movable thing. It can go forwards and go backwards. A bicycle is a movable thing. It can go forwards and backwards. An airplane is a movable thing. I can't say, make me a movable thing because like, well, what kind of movable thing? You can say, make me an airplane, make me an elephant, but you can't say, 
make me a movable thing. It doesn't make any sense, okay? It's an abstraction, it's an idea, okay? It's an idea of a thing that can go backwards and forward. That's all it is, and I haven't been specific at all. It's completely unspecific, it's entirely vague. So I can't say, make me one of those things, okay? They, they are ideas or they're contracts, okay? They're not actually um, objects. All right, um, so um, they can only contain constants, method signatures, um, not bodies. And you can also allow default and static methods. We're not gonna go into that in this class. We're really just gonna look at the very basics of interfaces in this class, okay? Um, so classes implement interfaces via the so-called implements keyword. So if I have an elephant, it can implement the movable thing interface. If I have an airplane, it can implement the movable thing keyword. That's the word we use. Later on, we're going to talk about inheritance some more. Inheritance uses the keyword extends. That's not what we do here. We use the word implements. So we say this thing implements that interface. Um, in other words, it's like saying this thing supports this contract, okay? Or offers this contract if you want to put it in English. Um, one interesting thing is although you can't create, you, although you can't create a movable thing because that doesn't make any sense, um, you can refer to one, okay? So I can have a variable called um, MT, movable thing, of type movable thing, and I can point it at an elephant, I can point it at an airplane, I can point it at uh, some concrete movable thing, some concrete object that implements movable thing. So I can actually have a type called movable thing and have a variable called MT or something, or foo or whatever you want, and have it refer to objects which implement that interface, which is kind of interesting. Okay. Um, Next mini quiz. What's going on here? If I can just find the right mouse. Uh, where are we up to? Already lost track of where I am. We're in 03. Very good. 03. Um, publish the poll. There it is. So sorry for the delay there. You should be able to see the poll on Piazza now. <clears throat> All right, so what we're going to do now is actually go and build some things, and we're going to do something very simple. Um, create a new package, create a new class, new Java class, and it's gonna be called interfaces. So it's going to be 03 dot interfaces, faces like that, and we'll add it. And what we're gonna do now is uh, we're going to write ourselves a very simple interface, which we're gonna do more of this sort of stuff um, later on in today's lecture. New um, Java uh, class, and we're going to create an interface and it's going to be called uh, uh, toxic. Okay. Oops, where is it? Toxic. Okay. So we're going to create a bunch of things which, um, what, which are, uh, where are we? Sorry, I've lost, uh, lost my examples here. So what we're going to do here is we're going to create a bunch of things um, that, um, that implement this. Uh, I've lost my notes. Sorry, folks, just for a minute here. And um, totally out of out of whack here. So what we're going to do here is we're going to declare something in here, which is what this contract is. So the interface, remember, is a contract. And what we're going to do is is we're just going to have one method in here, and it's going to say, okay, this thing's toxic. If it implements this interface, it must be a toxic thing. And then we're going to have a method which which returns a boolean, which says whether or not this toxic thing is actually lethal to an adult. So you could have something like. Um, uh, I don't know, like a redback spider uh, is toxic. Well, it, it, it's le it, it's got it's poisonous at least, and um, but it's not lethal to an adult human. Okay, it, it might send you to the hospital. It's not going to kill you. Okay, whereas a funnel web spider, the answer is yes. Okay, so we're going to have a boolean which says for this toxic thing, okay, it's toxic, but is it enough to kill you? Is really the question. And so what we're going to do is going to say public uh, boolean um, is lethal uh, to adult human, humans like that. Okay, there we are. So now what we've done is, what's this saying? Yeah, we don't need to, we don't need to do anything there. Okay, so we've, what we've done is we've said, we've declared a, um, a method in this interface called is lethal to adult humans. Now what we need to do is go and create some objects, uh, some types which implement this. Okay, so um, let's start off by doing something that's definitely toxic, which you all know is definitely toxic, we'll create a poison, okay? So new Java class, and we'll say um, new class is gonna be called cyanide, if I can spell that, cyanide. That's a, for those who don't know, cyanide's a very nasty poison, okay? Add it to git, and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna say implements um, uh, toxic, okay? Like that, there we are. Now, 
can interfaces contain methods that are not public? I think actually, you know, good question. I don't think I actually need that qualifier. There we are. Someone asked if I even need that. I don't think I do. And I'm going off script here anyway. So, <laughs> all right. So uh, we've got a red line here. Why is IntelliJ throwing a red line at us? Can anyone guess? Can anyone guess? Yeah, it's automatically public because the interface is public. Um, can anyone guess why there's a red line there? And the answer is we haven't implemented the parts of the contract that we said we would. Well, what this says is we're going to implement that contract, or the interface, Toxic. So what IntelliJ does is it can actually help us. There it is. We can go here and say implement the methods that we've forgotten. Okay. And there it is. Okay. So um, it did. It, it wrote all that code just for us. And oh, and I've spelled that wrong, haven't I? Let's just go fix the spelling up because I know there's people here who care about spelling, even if I don't. Um, there we are. Um, so there's cyanide, and we've got this thing here where it's overridden the thing that it needs to do, which is this, this contract. It's got to it's got to implement this method. That's the deal. It says if I'm going to implement this, I have to have this method in there. Okay. And the question is, is cyanide lethal at all humans? And the answer is yes. True. Okay. So we've done that. Now let's go to this class here, interfaces, and write ourselves a main method. Okay, I actually, actually, one more thing. We'll do one more, one more thing here. We're going to create ourselves a dog, a friendly dog. I've got a very friendly dog. Okay, we're going to create ourselves a dog. And um, we're not going to actually say anything about the dog. Okay, it's just a dog. All right. Now, we're going to create um, two objects. Um, now, um, what we, the first thing we're going to do is show that we can declare the type to be interface type, which I mentioned earlier. Okay, so I've got a variable here called nasty of type toxic, which is an interface type, and I've created a new object, which is a cyanide object, which we know implements the nasty type. Okay, now if I did this, that's not going to work, okay, because the dog doesn't implement the toxic interface, all right? So um, instead, what we need to do is declare it to be a dog. Okay. So now we have two variables, one called nasty, which is of an, refers to an object of type cyanide. And we've got another variable here called Fido, which refers to a dog. And we can create one more. Let's just do one more type here. New um, Java class. Um, uh, we'll call this one Redback. Okay, and add it to git, and then we'll say um, implements um, uh, toxic, right? Like that. And then IntelliJ says, hey, you need to implement the contract. You said you're going to implement toxic, but you haven't put the methods in. So we say, sure, put them in for me. So it goes and puts them in for us. And is a redback spider lethal to adult humans? No, it's not actually. Well, not normally anyway. So we're going to leave it that, that return false, uh, where cyanide is true. And we go here. What we can do now is we can create ourselves another toxic thing. Um, we'll call call it Charlotte, Charlotte the spider, new uh, redback spider. There it is, like that. Okay. Now. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an array of all these things. What type are the fields of this array going to have? Can someone tell me what type? I've got to make an array which contains all three of these things. Notice they have very little relationship between each other. We've got ourselves a poison, a spider, and a dog. A poison, a spider, and a dog. And I want to create an array which has all three of those things in there. So what type should the fields be? No, I can't use toxic because the dog's not toxic. Object, absolutely, that's exactly right. In Java, object is the um, is what everything inherits from object, okay? We can't use toxic in this case because the dog is not toxic, okay? Okay, uh, I'm glad someone <laughs> got the Charlotte reference. Okay, so object. Um, these, the word in English would use this thing, right? It's just a generic thing. We can't, they, they don't fall into any particular category, okay? And then I can declare it here like this, um, nasty, Fido, Charlotte, okay, like that. 
Now we have ourselves three things. And in Java, the, we use the word object to refer to things which have no particular type, no, um, the no, no, no more well-defined type. And then what we can do is we can go and iterate through them all and print them all out. Okay. So we can say for object T, T is the type thing, uh, is a thing, sorry. Go through all the things and then just print them all out. Um, um, T, right? And this is going to be pretty ugly because as you know, we didn't write a two string method for each of these types. So it's just going to use the default uh, two string method that uh, Java has. Oops, hang on. I'm going to run this. Run. Okay, so I'm going to run this. There it goes. And it just printed out all this go up here. Okay, not very nice, not very pretty. So it printed out uh, the cyanide, and that's this particular object number. That's a dog, and that's its object number, and the redback spider, and that's its object number. Question is, how can I know if one of these is toxic? Does anyone know? I've just got a thing here. I want to know if it's toxic. Can anyone know if it's toxic? How do I know that? There's a special thing we have in Java, a keyword, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> um, do, don't you have to use instance of to use the classes to string method? No, you don't. You can just print it out an object and um, it will use Java Lang objects to string method. But, but, um, yeah, J James has said it right. Yeah, and so so has uh, Yuan. Um So you just use instance of. That's a special thing we can use in Java that says um, we can do it like this. So if T is instance of, right? And IntelliJ already guessed that's what I wanted, right? Toxic. Then we can say T is is toxic. And then we can add on to that whether or not it's lethal, right? We can say um, uh, T dot um, is lethal to adult humans. Um, if it's lethal to adult humans, then we say, um, just get rid of that space there because I know some of you are watching. If it's lethal to adult humans, then we'll say, um, um, we'll print out um, and deadly and otherwise we'll print out nothing. Uh, not print out, but yeah, we'll print out nothing. I now have to get my parentheses right. This is kind of pretty horrific. Uh, wrong parentheses here. Lots of parentheses. Okay, there you go. All right, so now let's run this. And what should happen here is we're going to go through all these things, these three things. And if the thing is a toxic thing, then it will print this message out and it will tell us if it's, if it's lethal. Okay, so here we go. Let's run this. Okay, so notice that we didn't print out Fido. That's because Fido it doesn't implement toxic, which is great. Um, we can say something else like else s out um, t is nice, right? Like that. Okay, so you see that the dog is nice, and my need an extra space in there, and that the um, cyanide is toxic and deadly, whereas the um, redback spider is toxic. I know that's not. Uh, all right. All right. There you go. Um, one thing I want to point out is that I actually wanted to show you what happens if you do this, which is what you would have typed if you, which is what I, I actually typed. But the, the problem is IntelliJ auto corrected me. I wanted to do that. Okay. I was going to type that. That's actually what I typed, but IntelliJ just automatically corrected me. And what's the issue with this? What's the issue with this? Um, does anyone know what, what, why there's a problem here? We can't call the instance of method uh, against a, something that is of type object because it may or may not be um, implementing the toxic uh, the toxic interface. Turns out, of course, we know very well that it is implementing that toxic interface because it's inside this if statement. Therefore, we know that it is. Okay, but what we need to do is we need to convince Java that it is. Okay, yeah, because because object doesn't have that method. So we actually have to say this is not just an object. This is actually an instance of toxic. So we do. Oops, hang on. Uh, keys again. There we go. We do this. Okay, and that stuff there got put in automatically. We cast it as someone said in on the chat. We cast it to the type toxic. Okay, and um, IntelliJ did that for me automatically. If you go back and watch the video, you'll see I just typed is lethal adult, adult humans and IntelliJ put all the rest of the stuff in there. And then what that's doing is saying, this is not just any old object, it's actually one that implements a toxic interface. And then it's quite happy to call the method is lethal to adult humans. Okay, if we didn't do that, it, you see it comes up with a red, red underline. All right, I think that's the end of that. And it's um, just after 11. So what I'm gonna do, 
yeah what I'm going to do now is we're going to take a very quick break um, just uh, two or three minutes break I know you guys um, I'm supposed to give you a break at 11 so we're just going to take a quick break I'll answer some questions and we'll come back in a sec All right, wrong mic, sorry. I've got two mics going here. I, I unmuted the wrong one. All right, so end of break. We're back at it. Um, uh, yeah, so I told you at the start of the course that objects that objects have encapsulate two key concepts. What are the two key concepts that objects encapsulate? Anyone? Objects encapsulate what? Can anyone remember? There's two key ideas that an object encapsulates. Hopefully you can hear me now. No one, everyone's silent. Okay, they encapsulate state and behavior. State and behavior, you really need to know this. Objects encapsulate state and behavior, okay? Behavior, yeah, state and behavior, well done. All right, <laughs> state and behavior, there's a lag on this on this stream. Okay, very good. So um, state and behavior is what objects encapsulate and yeah, fields is the way we describe state. And what do we use to describe um, behavior? I kind of gave it away there. What do we use to, to describe behavior? So we've got an object, we use its fields to describe its state, and we use something else to describe its behavior. Okay? We use methods. All right, so methods of a behavior, fields of a state. Methods, behavior, feel the state, okay? So when we have an object, we have state and behavior together, okay? Sometimes you want to encapsulate only behavior, okay? So how could you do that? If I wanted to give you something which basically gave you a behavior, like a, um, a condition or something, how would I do that? Well, it turns out it's actually not that hard. I can just give you an object which has no fields that just has that behavior. That's one way I could, one way I could do it. That's kind of clumsy, okay? Lambda expressions are a way in Java of encapsulating behavior more gracefully than that, okay? And that's what we're going to do here. So from Java version 8, Lambda expressions allow code to be passed as a parameter, just like data, okay? So um, you'll notice that in the um, GUI for the game, we use these Lambda expressions a lot because they're quite useful for things like event handling. So I can ha pass a behavior which says that when the following happens, do this behavior, okay? So when someone clicks the mouse, do this behavior. So I'm gonna give you the behavior I wanna have happen when a particular thing happens, okay? So when someone clicks the mouse, do this. When someone hits the spacebar, do that, okay? So that behavior I wanna pass as a as a thing and the thing we, we use in Java is what's called a Lambda expression. Okay, and the uh, the syntax. Okay, I can see I'm slightly overridden. Uh, the the little you know, we get rid of that. There you, go, you can see the whole slide now. Okay, so the syntax um, is comma has comma comma separated parameters, so you can give parameters to the expression. Then followed by an arrow. You can see it down here, right? 
So there's the parameters. There's only one in this case, very, very simple. Then there's an arrow, that's the arrow. Then there's a body. This body here is really simple. Either a single expression, that's exactly what that is, x is greater than 100, or it can be a statement block. Here you say x, that's the comma, comma, comma separated formal parameters. In this case, there's only one parameter, it's x. Um, and there's no comma because there's only one. Um, and then there's an arrow, and then there's a body. And the body here has got the curly braces and it's returning a Boolean, okay? So um, that there is the simplest form of a lambda expression. This one here is a very simple inline form, the most simple you can get. And here, this is essentially the same, except we've replaced that little expression there with a statement block. Okay, um, uh, Java also supports these things called functional interfaces. We're gonna use them in a moment. And so if you think that sounds weird, don't worry, we're gonna use it very clearly in a moment. And um, they allow us to pass these things around with a type. Okay, so I can say, I can declare a variable x of type int predicate, and then I can use that, uh, there's a method on this interface, anything that's an int predicate will support a method called test, which will return true or false, depending on whether this predicate is true or false. So you can say, you know, x is greater than 100. You can, you can test some value and decide whether it's true or false. You can also do and, so I can say this predicate and that predicate must be true. I can do or saying this or that must be true and I can negate saying the opposite of what this predicate is. Okay, so they're the methods and we can we can have a look on the web page here. So some of you might wonder what that is. I just brought this up a few minutes ago. There you go. So I just did a web search for, um, let me show you the web search. Okay, so just search for in predicate. Then this is the proper uh, documentation for Java from Oracle. That's where the actual formal documentation for the language comes from. And you can see an in predicate is an interface that supports um, and, negate, or, and test. We're gonna use test in a few minutes. Um, okay. And the, there are other ones like this one here, which is a double supply, which is an interface which returns doubles, get as a double. Okay, now uh, time for the mini quiz. That was pretty quick. This is a pretty quick unit. Um, There we go, I've published the poll there, and let's go write some code for on Lambda expressions. This should be fairly fast. It's um, fairly fast and fairly useful, and you may not use this terribly much, except one place you're definitely gonna use it is when you do the the uh, GUI, uh, when you do the uh, user interface for assignment two, okay? And create a new unit here, new class. Um, where is it? Let me bring this up here, uh, Java 9, J09 dot, um, what, is it, what are we going to call this? Lambda. Lambda, there you go. So we're going to do lambda expressions here. I'm going to add it to git. And what we're going to do is write some very, very simple code here. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'll write myself, write myself a static method. Static void um, print big. And it'll take a value. Actually, let's just change the name of it. Print if big. Uh, no, we'll just say print big. <laughs> just call it that for the minute. Int predicate. There it is. That's what I want. Notice when I press uh, enter here, IntelliJ goes and does the appropriate import there. And we've got int predicate, which is gonna be the big test. It's gonna be the test of whether something's big or not. Okay. You can't see my face. Oh, that's terrible. All right, now you can see my face. <laughs> Okay, um, all right, so there we are. Um, yeah, I, I just turned that off so you can, um, so you could uh, see the, the, the bottom of the slide there. Incidentally, th I, I don't know how much you guys find this useful. The reason why I do uh, have the little face in the corner here is because there's studies that show that people actually find this more engaging. Not not for me, you probably find it less engaging for me, but studies actually show that it's more engaging to have a person talking to you than just, just, a, just a, a disembodied voice. And if you lip read, I actually lip read, okay? Because I've got a hearing impairment, a serious hearing imp impairment. Um, if you lip read, it's actually a heck of a lot easier if you can see someone's face. So that's the reason why I have a face there, <laughs> in case you're wondering. Um, all right. Um, all right, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna do a test to see if this value, oops, I type, type bit test, not big test. It should be big test. All right, so if, Okay, so this here is our predicate. It's a behavior, okay? That's a behavior, okay? That's a particular value someone gave. This is a very silly contrived example. What we're gonna do is we're gonna say, if our value is big according to what this behavior says, who knows what the behavior is, but the behavior is some sort of thing of, of testing whether something is 
big, okay? If it's big, we'll, we'll write something out like this. Um, otherwise, All right, okay, there we go. Um, so we've just written ourselves a very simple static method, and all it's gonna do is print out two one of two different things, depending on whether that value is big or not big, okay? Um, now what we're gonna do is write our PSVM thing here, our main method, like that, and we're going to do the following. We're gonna call that method, print big, and what do we need to pass to it? We need to pass a value. So we just pass it some integer. It doesn't really matter what, just like that. And then we need to pass it a lambda, an int predicate. So we can do that by doing the following. That's our argument. That's our arrow. And then we say x greater than some, some number. It doesn't really matter what, okay? That thing there is a lambda expression, okay? It's a lambda expression which satisfies int predicate, okay? And so if we run this, what's gonna happen is we're gonna pass 200 as a value. We're gonna pass this behavior as a lambda. And then we're gonna run this code here and say, is the value 200 big? Uh, tr do we return true from the test for this particular test? And it'll run this test and we'll say, um, is uh, 200 greater than a um, thousand? We'll say, no, it won't. So it'll print this one out. It'll say no, All right? So let's just run this like that. Okay, no, 200 is not big. And what's this dot test? That is, um, int predicate is an interface, as I mentioned earlier, and I showed you on the on the um, Oracle webpage here. There it is. So it's an interface, and it has a test method that returns a Boolean. So it evaluates this predicate on a given argument, okay? And the argument we had was um, the value, okay? Which in this case is 200. So it, it evaluates that with respect to 200, and the answer is no, it's not bigger than 1,000, okay? If I made, put an extra zero in there, of course, then it would say yes. Right, like that. All right, so there you go. So it's evaluating this expression. That thing there is the lambda expression, okay? You can make this more explicit by actually creating a variable of type int predicate. There you go, and IntelliJ is second guessing me. All right, um, uh, so this is a big test. We call this BT, stands for big test. And we can just write it out like this, just like we had before. And then what we can do is we can say um, print big, and then pass it uh, 10, um, pass it the, the, the lambda expression, and we can call it again with a different value. Um, uh, let's give it a slightly bigger one, so it actually passes that test. And then we run this, run this example here. Okay, and there we go, and it, and it ran. So. Um, First of all, it does this test and compares 200 using this Lambda expression, which says X has to be bigger than a thousand. So that's one way of defining big. And then here it runs this test, so it compares 10 with this Lambda expression, which defines big in terms of 100. And it says, no, it's not big. And then it compares 200 against this expression here, where, um, and, and it is big, because it's bigger than a hundred. So yes, it is. All right. Um, all right, what we're gonna do now is, because we're a little low on time, we're gonna move on. And Lambda expressions are implicitly a type. You can see there it was, uh, well, they they implement uh, different um, interfaces implicitly, just like the toString method is on every object. You, when you write a Lambda expression, the, depending on the type of the Lambda expression, it will infer which interface is implementing. In this case, it was int predicate, okay? You saw that. All right, uh, we're uh, wrong, on to the wrong page. Okay, next. Inheritance, okay, we're now diving into inheritance. This is a big lecture and we've got something big uh, going on here, which is, um, this is one of the, a really, really key piece of learning going on here. Um, so please try and pay attention. You may wanna watch this again um, if this doesn't all make sense to you. We're gonna cover inheritance, overriding and hiding, polymorphism, and the super keyword, okay? A number of really big 
big ideas going on here. Now you remember in all my examples, I talked about inheritance. One, the example, what was the example I've given you again and again about inheritance, which is pretty pretty simple, and I use it to describe objects. What was it? It used and I used it to describe static variables and instance variables. What's this example I keep repeating? Can anyone remember? I use the example of a bicycle, right? So you've got uh, perhaps something like a Java Lang object, which is in English we'd say a thing. Then you've got say a vehicle. Then you've got say a, um, a bicycle. And then you've got different kinds of bicycles. Then you've got a particular model of bicycle. And then you can create an instance, which is your instance of this particular bicycle. Yep. And yeah, uh, Comp 1110 student, I gave you a, an example of that. And we had a person, we had a, a Java Lang object, then we had person, then we had student, then we had Comp 1110 student. Okay. So we had a hierarchy of types. Okay. A class hierarchy being going, becoming more and more specific, starting very abstract with um, a person, then going to student, then Comp 1110 student. And then, um, uh, yeah, and that was the most most specific we got. All right. So, and I told him when I repeat these concepts again and again and again. So we're coming back to inheritance. Um, an inherent inherited class is known as a subclass. Okay. So Comp 1110 student is a subclass of student. Okay. Um, it can also be referred to as a derived class or a child class. The literature on object oriented programming goes back a long way um, to the seventies, I guess. And um, so it's, it's, it's a big field, it's an old field, and there are many languages that are object-oriented languages, and um, people use different, different English words to describe these concepts, okay? Um, and uh, so people sometimes say subclass when they mean the child, sometimes they mean derived, they, they say derived class when they mean the child, and as I just said, child class is pretty commonly used. Um, in terms of the, the relationship going upwards, we say um, the parent is, off, is typically referred to as a superclass, Sometimes we say the base class, which I find a little confusing because often if you think of it as a hierarchy going this way, which to think of that as a base is sometimes a little bit confusing. And it's very often referred to as a parent class. Okay. So super class, parent class, or base class. Okay. So um, when you define a subclass, you use the extends keyword to point out that um, this class is extending a particular type. All classes in, in implicitly inherit ultimately going up the inheritance chain. Ultimately, they inherit from Java Lang object. You don't need to say that. So you don't need to say um, foo extends Java Lang object. If you just say foo, then it implicitly extends Java Lang object. That's implicit. That's one of those quirks of the language that things are not explicit. This one is not explicit. It's implicit. Okay. Um, overriding and hiding methods. Um, all right. Uh, if a method has the same signature as one of its super superclasses, it's said to override. What's an example that you've seen that of, of that of, of overriding an instance method? Can any, anyone think of an example of overriding an instance method? We've done this a lot of times. This should be easy, right? An example where we've overridden a method of an instance. Yeah, to string. Yeah, you've seen me do it again and again and again because that's a very obvious one. It allows you to um, print out. A description of the object and the way it's done by default is not very pretty so we very often override that behavior so for a given type we have a nice way of printing out a particular instance of that type all right so when you have the same uh, method name the same number and type of parameters and the same return type then you've overridden the method okay now what's important is that the type of the instance determines the method okay because i can refer to i can have a variable called um person person bob and then I can I can refer to a Comp 1110 student, Bob, okay? So this Bob, Bob is indeed a person, but um, when I say, when I try to print out Bob, which method, will, which two string method will get called? Will it be the one on person, the one on object, the one on student, or the one on the Comp 1110 student? The answer is absolutely clear. It's whatever type Bob is. And I just told you that Bob was actually a Comp 1110 student. Therefore, the Comp 1110 student to string method will be the one that gets called. Even though my reference, the reference I'm referring to this thing over here, that is a generic one called person. Okay. So I, um, so I have a person called Bob who happens, who happens to be a Comp 1110 student. When I call the print method on Bob, what will happen is it'll determine exactly what type Bob is and call the appropriate to string method for that particular type. Um, yeah, you can have different methods with different numbers of inputs. That's completely normal. Um, they're totally different methods. It's very commonly done where you want to have something more or less specific. That's someone's asking that question on the uh, on the chat there. Um, it's a little different to overloading. But anyway, we, can, we, we won't go into that now. Um, uh, so class methods. So if it has a signature, it hides the superclass method. Okay, if it has the same signature. So if you have 
a static method. So instance methods, hopefully you're all getting familiar with the idea of an instance method versus a class method. The class method has the word static in front, okay? So if it has a, um, if you have two class methods that are the same, it's called hiding, okay? Not overriding. Notice this is overriding, okay? When you, you the, the two string example was overriding, okay? If you did the same thing with a static method, that's called hiding. And um, the class with respect to which the call is made determines the method. This is generally considered bad practice. This is common and it's generally considered good practice. But hiding the superclass method of a static method is, is usually not a good idea. Okay. Polymorphism is when the variable may refer to an instance that is more specific than the type. I just gave you an example. Can anyone tell me what's an example I gave you just about uh, one minute ago? That is, a variable is more general in its type than the actual particular instance it's referring to. Right, the example I gave you is when I said Bob was declared to be type person, but actually, yeah, uh, the actual Bob object was type comp 1110 uh, student, all right? So the particular type of that object was very specific, comp 1110 student, but I declared the variable as just person because I didn't know perhaps at the time I was declaring the variable what type it would be, all right? The method that is called depends on the type of the instance, not the type of the reference field. Right? And I basically said this a moment ago. So if I've got a, a, a variable Bob, which is the type person, and I call to string, it's not going to call persons to string, the, the, the to string method for person. It's going to call the to string method for the actual object Bob, which happens to be of type comp 1110 student in my example I've just contrived. Okay, so it's going to call the to string method of the concrete example. All right, hiding fields. When a subclass is used, uses a field name that is already used by a field in the superclass, the superclass field is hidden. And that's a bad idea, but you're allowed to do it, okay? The super keyword, really important idea. You've already seen me use it. Now I'm, I'm more formally introducing you to the idea. You can access an overridden or hidden member of a superclass by using the super keyword. When would you want to do this? And, and a hint here, I did it in the last lecture and there's a good reason for it. What was the reason why I used the super keyword in the last lecture? Can anyone remember? What was the reason for using the super keyword in the last lecture? Uh, the example I gave was when I used the two string method on comp 1110 student. What I wanted to do is as I made went more and more specific from the person to the student to the comp 1110 student, what I wanted to do was, um, what I wanted to do is I became more and more specific is to um, use the two string method of the parent type and add a bit more information. So instead of write, repeating my code every single time, I just said for the two string method for the comp 1110 student, I said, just use the two string method of the student and then add a bit more information just for comp 1110. Okay, so if you go back and look at the code from the 03 module or 02 module, um, you'll see that that's what I did. All right, and we do do it in constructors too. Yeah, it's commonly done in constructors. So if I want to create a new object of type um, uh, comp 1110 student, what I really wanted to do is the same sort of stuff that I do for a generic student plus a few more specific things. So when I'm making something more specific, I probably want to do the same things that my parent type does plus something else. And instead of repeating it all, I'll call my parent class and get them to do the stuff that's in common between us. And then I'll just do the part that's specific. All right. And with that, we'll move on to the mini quiz. And then we're just about ready to finish this um, lecture with a, a giant coding example. Where are we? Oh, man. Publish the poll. Okay, the poll's been published. And we move on to our coding example now. And this is a big one. Okay, so brace yourselves, guys. This is a big example. Um, and, and I've got half an hour to do it. <laughs> so let's see how we go. All right, a little bit behind. I have to move fast. Okay, so I'm going to start by creating a new Java class um, called um, O04.inheritance. There it is. Okay, and we'll put a, a, a main method in there. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a whole lot of types and later on in, in this little coding segment, we're going to give those types something, make those types part of a hierarchy, okay? To start with, I'll just create a whole lot of types really quickly that are apparently unrelated. Then I'll add in some parent classes that relate them all, okay? So let's just start off by creating these classes. Um, if I could just remember a new class. Okay, I'm gonna call this albatross. This is, this is gonna be animals. So um, for those of you who understand biology, you can get ready to correct me for all my um, 
biological errors here as we go along. We're creating a class called Albatross. We're um, creating a class uh, called uh, Dog. Um, we're creating a class called um, Eastern Brown Snake. And hopefully you can see these are all different types of animals. Um, and we're going to create a fruit bat. And they have, these animals have interesting biological relationships between each other, which is why we're using these examples. We're going to create a funnel web spider. Oh, we'll call it red back spider. Back spider. Okay, red back spider, like we had before. Add it. Um, new class will create a great white shark. White shark. And we'll create a human. And just to make things nice and complicated, we're going to create ourselves a platypus. There we go. Monty Python. All right. So what we're going to do here is um, now we're going to create these actual objects here. So we'll create um, an albatross called Alex equals new um, albatross like that. Very simple. Um, a uh, dog called Spot. This is very, very simple stuff. So far, hopefully none of this is surprising to you. We're just creating a whole lot of different objects of different types. That's all we're doing so far. Uh, fruit bat called Fred. New fruit bat like that. Then we'll create an Eastern Brown snake. Um, snake, a snake called Steph. Like that. Uh, we'll create a great white shark called Bruce, like that. And what else we got here? Funnel, uh, redback spider, Charlotte. Okay, like that. Um, and a platypus, uh, Pat, new platypus. All right, I think, we've, have we got them all? I guess we have. Oh no, we haven't created the human, man. We forgot the human. And Bob equals new human. Okay, there we are. Perry the platypus, all right. I don't know the reference. It's always good to have a reference. All right, there we go, Perry the platypus. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a an array of all these animals. So what type, what type does that array need to be? I'm gonna create an array in Java of and of these creatures, all these different creatures, what type is that going to be? Well, there's no relationship in Java yet. We haven't made, I mean, you all know because of your basic um, analogy, uh, basic knowledge of biology, you know that there's a relationship. Java doesn't, it just thinks it's just a bunch of different types that have no connection at all. So at the moment we have no choice but to declare it as an array of objects. Okay, they're things. As far as Java is concerned, they're just things. All right, so um, we're going to call them animals ourselves because we know the animals, but Java doesn't know. Okay, so now we have to go Alex, Spot, Fred, um, Steph, um, Bruce, Bruce, Charlotte, Perry, and Bob. Bob, okay, Bob. All right, so there we have an array of these creatures, um, which we know are animals, but Java doesn't know that. And then what we can do is we can go through them. We say for A in animals, um, and then print them out. Um, what do we want to say? Okay, here, just, just print it out. Okay, like that. All right, this is going to be ugly. Uh, what have I done wrong here? Oh, better to say object. Gotta, you have to give it a type object. There we are. All right, so we've got to say A is of type object, and we're going to print out all of those objects. And, and then we run this, and it's going to be very extremely unexciting. Um, it's just going to print them all out. All right, so it's going to go through that list, and it's going to print them out in the, in the ugly way there. All right, so hopefully everyone understood everything so far. We've just created a bunch of 
apparently unrelated types as far as Java is concerned. They're just a bunch of unrelated types. And now we as humans are going to inject into this mess of things a structure. And the structure is going to be based on biology. Okay. So what we're going to do first is we're going to create a type called animal. New um, Java class animal. And we're going to give it some basic info. Okay. Oops. We're going to give it a string for the name because everyone wants their animals to have names. Um, and we're going to give it an age. Oops. Um, int age. There you go. And we need a constructor. So oh, what was it? Alt. Oh man, I've already forgotten. Was it alt insert? Now I've got this weird keyboard, so I don't even know if it's going to work. Let me just try. Alt shift insert. Oh man, I can't. Sorry, that's not going to work. I'll just have to type it out by hand. Someone can remind me later what the key, key uh, shortcut was. Ah, cancel. Oh, I've done the wrong thing now. Okay, public. I'm trying to create a constructor and I, and I was trying to uh, use a shortcut animal like that. Um, string name int age. There you go. And then um, this dot name equals um, name. So that means our field name is going to be the same as the one that got passed to us. This dot age age equals um, age. That is our field called age is going to be equal to whatever the parameter was. Now let's write ourselves a two string method. Okay. So we'll do the same thing at override like that. And we'll say two string, um, string public string two string. Man, if I could just type string to string, there it is like that. Okay, um, and then we're going to return the string and the string is going to say the name. And then we'll say um, what they are. I'll say name like Bob is a. Uh. Now, how do we know what type this uh, this animal is? So if I have uh, um, um, spot the dog, how do we know what type it is? Well, it's from its class. Okay, so what we can do is we can actually say ask what its class is. And we, there's actually a way to do this in Java. And that is we can ask its class by saying get class, get class. Okay, and that will return the class of that particular type. And then we can actually use another thing, which is get simple name, get canonical name, get simple name. And that will return the simple class name, which in this case will be dog or Eastern brown snake or fruit bat or whatever that those names are that are listed on the screen there. And then we can say plus so that's what this is doing is saying for this particular object, what's my class? My class is platypus. And then what's the simple name for that? It's a string P L A T Y P U S, right? So platypus, right? And it, we're going to add that to our string for the two string method. And then we're going to add in, um, oops, comma aged. And then we'll add the age. Okay. So we've got a nice little two string method now for our animal. Now let's go and create some other types. Um, let's, Let's go and add those. Um, oh, good on you, Liam. All right, so I, I don't need to go and read that. I'll probably just forget it all. Okay, so there's a bunch of shortcuts and they'll depend on which um, which operating system you're using, whether it's Mac OS or Windows or um, Linux. Anyway, let's go and make some more types. We need to put, add a tiny bit more structure to our, our um, to our um, hierarchy here. We're going to create an arachnid. And that extends animal, right? Okay. And then it wants us to do the constructor for this thing, create a constructor matching the super. There you go. So arachnid for those of you who don't know, that's, that's a proper name for things like spiders. And, um, then we're going to create another type here, new Java class. Um, what, what else we've got here? We've got a bird and yeah, same deal. Yep. Add it extends animal. So all these things extend animal, right? And then it says you need to create a constructor. So we do that. So now we have a constructor for bird, which matches the constructor for an animal. And then we're going to um, have what else? We've got a fish, um, new class fish. And add it to git extends animal like that. And then we'll add the constructor there. Okay. And then um, what else we have? We have a uh, mammal, new Java class, a uh, mammal. Did I, mammal's got two M's in it, doesn't it? Oh, well, uh, rename factor, refactor, rename. Is that right? Two, 
Is that two M's? No, that's right. I can't spell. You can tell that. All right. Mammal um, extends animal. Extends animal. There we go. And it wants to put the constructor in. There we go. It's constructor for mammal. And then we've got, um, yeah, two M's. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Mammals. Very good. Thanks, guys. As long as one of one of the 400 of you can spell properly, we're all good. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm first and foremost I'm an engineer by training, and engineers famously can't spell. All right, um, next we've got just a couple more to go here. We're nearly done. Um, a mammal, we've got a monotrine. Monotrine, and it extends animal. So a lot of this is boilerplate, but hopefully you're getting the hang of how this stuff works. Animal extends animal. Right, and same here. There we go, and we've only got one left to go, which is going to be the reptile. Okay, whoops, oh my goodness, keyboard. All right, we're gonna, now we've got to add a reptile. New Java class um, reptile. And that also extends animal. All right, so now we've got ourselves a, a nice hierarchy, extends animal, and then add that, like that. And with that, we can now go back to our interface inheritance thing here, and we can make these more specific, okay? Um, so now, oh, we've got to go and make each one of these things more specific. So an albatross extends bird, bird, and add its type. So we're gonna go through and make each one of these specific types inherit the proper family type. So now, albatross extends bird, which extends animal, which extends Java Lang object. Monotrines of type mammal, very good. Yep, we're getting there. Um, Animal arachnid. Oh, actually, did, did I not do that? Okay, very good. That should be mammal. Okay, very good. Thank you for picking that up. That, that was actually a point I wanted to try and make. Okay, so we've got a type which extends another type, which extends another type. Um, alrighty. Um, uh, sorry, we've done uh, the very concrete ones now. Dog is a type mammal. Right, there we go, and it's asking us to put the constructor in. There we are, we've got the constructor. Eastern brown snake extends reptile. Reptile. And we're gonna put its constructor in. Like that. Um, fruit bat is a type of mammal. Oops, hang on. Double click. Um, extends mammal, some people don't know that. Fruit bat is a type of mammal. Okay, great white shark is a fish. Okay, and uh, there we go. There's the stands fish. A human is a type of mammal. Oops. And add the constructor for the human. Um, platypus is type uh, monotrine. And the Rebecca spider is a type arachnid and we're done. Extends arachnid. Oops. Okay. And that's all done. Now let's go back to our interface type. Uh, sorry, our inheritance type. Now it said, hey, you haven't constructed these objects right. So now we need to go and give these names and ages because, so look here, it says change signature. No, we don't do that. So what we actually want to do here is add in the string, which is the name, Alex, and give Alex an age. 30, uh, 30 it's an old old albatross. They live for a long time. Um, spot, dogs don't live so long, sadly. Um, Spot's only seven, and I have no idea how long fruit bats live for. I'm sure sharks live for a long time. And the spider, I don't think they live very long.
Perry. And Bob the humans. Someone in our class, perhaps. I don't know if there's actually a Bob in our class, but we'll just pretend they are. There we are. So now um, we've we've done this, and we can run run um, this here. Run the run run the code again, and now we should get a much look. Now we've got much nicer um, messages being printed out because we've got we're calling the two string method on the type. Notice that the type here of of a is type object. It does not call the two string method on object. It calls the two string the two string method on the actual concrete type. So it calls the Alex two string method, spots two string method, and so forth. So it will call the albatross two string method, the dog two string method, and so forth, not the object one. But as someone's pointed out, we can now go and change this to animal, right, like that, because they're, they are actually all animals. And we can change this to animal, right? And now what we can do is we can um, add something specific just to, uh, we'll give Perry, Perry a few more years. All right, so because we like platypuses, what we're gonna do is give Perry some other, some other specific behavior. Um, and so Perry is gonna have the ability to talk. Um, so uh, void um, quack, I'm sure that's what the platypuses do. Quack um, Perry and Okay, so Perry now has that capability. And now we're gonna use that in here, but we can't just um, go and say a.quack. Okay, that's not gonna work um, because not all animals have this ability. So, um, <laughs> um, so what we're gonna do instead is we're going to say, how do we know if A is a, is a platypus? Anyone know how we know if A is a platypus? What is the way of finding out whether whether A, this particular animal, is of type platypus. There's a very concrete way to do it. We did it a few minutes ago in the, in a, in the previous part of the lecture. The way we do it is with instance of, okay? A dot instance of platypus, then we can say A dot quack, okay? It's still complaining. Why is it complaining? Because at this point, Java still thinks that A is of type object. So we need to actually cast it, as someone else said, cast it to a type platypus. We do it like this. We say, actually, you know what? A is really a platypus. We're sure of that. And then Java is maybe happy with that. What's happening here? Oh, platypus, sorry, my parentheses are all wrong. And now Java is happy with that. So, okay, I believe you, A is a type platypus. I'll check it at runtime. If that's wrong, then I will um, raise an error. But for now, we'll take um, Perry to be a, uh, that animal is of type platypus and therefore it can quack. We run the thing and we'll find that Perry goes quack. All right, now the last thing I want to do is, um, is to go and add an interface, okay? And the interface we're gonna add is um, Venom, uh, Venomous, okay? So we're gonna add a new interface here, new um, Java interf interface called Venomous. Venomous, if I can just spell the flipping thing, Venomous, like that, like that. Interface Venomous, and then we can do the same thing as what we did before uh, with Toxic, okay? Where's Toxic? We'll just grab this, okay? So that's interface, and it's gonna be is lethal to adult humans. And then we can add, we can say which of these animals implements the venomous interface. So quickly, which one, um, which one of these animals is actually, um, which one of these animals is actually venomous? Anyone know? Let's quickly go through, through these things here. Uh, and we're gonna be concrete. So Eastern brown snake, definitely. Okay, extends reptile and implements venomous, okay? The Eastern Brown Snake is, now it's raised a squiggly line because we haven't implemented the method, so we need to um, implement the method. Okay, we do that, and we have to say, is it lethal adult humans? Absolutely, an Eastern Brown Snake, for those of you who are not in Australia, Eastern Brown Snakes, they, we've got loads of them in Canberra, and they can kill you. Not very often, but they can, okay? So these are lethal to humans, all right? So next we go to um, Fruit Bat, no, Great White Shark, they can kill you too, but they're not, le they're not poisonous. Um, a venomous is what I meant to say. Platypus. A lot of you don't realize this, but a platypus actually, or at least male platypus are, and Perry's male, I assume, male platypuses are actually venomous. So um, not widely known. They have a ner nerve agent in their hind spur, and it's extraordinarily painful. But it's not lethal. It's just 
unbelievably painful. All right, now we go to the uh, Redback Spider and the Redback Spider also implements the interface Venomous. And there it is, add that. And um, although they they are very poisonous, they probably won't kill an adult. So we'll just say false. All right, now what we can go do is we can go to inheritance here and we can go through those animals again. We can say, um, <clears throat> The following animals are venomous. Like that. And then we just grab ourselves a for loop like this. And then how do we know if it's venomous? Um, well, we can go through all of them and we'll say if it's an instance of venomous, right? So we're going, to, we're going to go through each of those animals, all those animals are there. And then as we go through each one, if it implements the venomous interface, which means it's an instance of the type venomous, then we need to change this to venomous. We're not going to call the quack method, that, that won't work. We, will, um, we want to call the um, let's do this, um, S out, we're going to print out A. We're going to print out the, the actual name, right? Uh, and then we're going to say, um, is venomous. Let's actually, just to make this code a little bit clearer, you can do it more succinctly than what I'm doing now, but just for clarity, I'm going to do the following. Um, Boolean deadly equals, um, now we're going to, force A to be venomous, because, oops, whoa, that's not what I wanted to do. <clears throat> venomous, um, A, so we're gonna say A is venomous, and we'll do that, okay? So now what we're doing is we're gonna create, instantiate that variable there deadly to be equal to whether or not this thing is an adult human. Notice we had to tell, we had to tell Java that A is not just an animal, but it's a venomous one. So we've actually had to do this. I know there's an if statement there, which makes us know that it's venomous, but here we have to assert that it is by casting it to venomous, okay? And it will do a check at when the program's running, it'll do a check and say, oh, I'll just check that that really is venomous, okay? And now Java is happy. And now we'll say, um, like this, we'll say A is venomous, ven Um And then we'll say, depending on <clears throat> whether or not it's deadly, um, if it's deadly, we'll say, um, and it's, um, lethal, right? Otherwise we'll say, and fortunately not deadly. Okay. Or non-lethal just to use common language, non lethal. Okay, we do that. And now we write this out. We, we run the program. Okay, so now what we do here, I'll just put an extra blank line here. So it's a bit easier to read. So print line with nothing in it will just give us a blank line. So do that. There we go. So it says the following animals are venomous. Steph is a Neeson brown snake, age 12. It's venomous and it's lethal. We don't need to say it's venomous because we already said that above. So we can just get rid of that bit of code there. Like that. Make it a bit prettier. So Steph is age 12 and it's lethal. Charlotte is red back spider, age one, unfortunately non-lethal. And Perry is a platypus, unfortunately non-lethal. There we are. Um, yeah, ternary operator, absolutely, that's right. Okay, with that, we finished that whole section. I hope, let me just quickly recap what we did there because we covered a lot of ground, okay? I reiterated the idea of inheritance. We work through inheritance by looking at things in terms of a hierarchy that you should be familiar with, and that is the animal kingdom, okay? We've, so we've got the, the, the top of the hierarchy, we've got what Java calls object, which in English we'd say thing, okay? Then we've got an animal, and then under animal, we've got different types of animals. We've got reptiles, we've got mammals and um, monotremes and things like that. 
And then we've got particular types of animal, okay, like dog and so forth. And then we make instances of those. Notice a dog is not an instance. Dog is merely a type, okay? And we made an instance of dog called Spot, which is a very concrete one um, called Spot. And then um, these, then, then what we did is we are able to go and create an array of all these different animals. Once we once we'd made all those types inherit from animal, then we could make this array be an array of animal. Then we wrote a for loop and that checked to see which of them was of a particular instance, the platypus, and we did something specific just for the platypus. Then we did a for loop and found out which of those there um, implemented um, the venomous interface. And then we wrote something about it implementing the interface. So there we've managed to merge two ideas, the idea of inheritance, which is the subject of this part of the lecture, and interfaces, which we covered previously today. Okay, and in this example here, we bring the two together, inheritance and interfaces. Venomous is an interface and um, the, uh, the, the, the inheritance is uh, the, um, um, sorry, we've covered venomous, which is, which is an interface and everything else there is uh, an inheritance hierarchy. You can go and draw this out on a piece of paper if you want, if you want to recap your biology. Finally, let's move on and do um, the uh, last part of the lecture, which is the bio. There we are. And our bio today is John von Neumann. Okay. Um, who's heard of John von Neumann? Does anyone want to say anything that's not on the slide that, that, is fa that John von Neumann is famous for? Okay, there's a great uh, biography of John von Neumann. Um, it's called, what is it called? The um, Prisoner's Dilemma, I think it's called. It's called something like that. Um, I really enjoyed reading that biography. He's one of the most influential people, uh, influential intellectuals of the last century. Uh, if you go to his Wikipedia page, you'll be look at you and look at the things that he's famous for it's just extraordinary you have to use a scroll thing to scroll through all the different things he's famous for um he was a very famous mathematician was involved um was involved um all right uh, was involved in um the manhattan project so he was involved with the atomic bomb um some say that um if you've watched dr strange love which is one of my favorite movies of all time I've watched watched Doctor Strange Love. There's a there's a there's a crazy character in there, and some say he's a um, like a mashup of John von Neumann and, and Teller, the, the 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 who invented the hydrogen bomb. Um, he was one of the people who characterized the von Neumann architecture, which is of course named after him. The von Neumann architecture is the one that you use today. We all use today, which. The novelty in it was that the program and the data were both in the computer together. That wasn't how early computers worked. With the early computers, they were quite separate. And you saw the photographs I had before with the cables, which essentially defined the program because that was the connections that made the, comp the computation and the data was separate, okay? Von Neumann architecture put them all together. At the time, a completely radical idea. Now it's absolutely normal and it's what we all uh, know. Uh, random numbers, he co-developed um, the so-called Monte Carlo method, which is a, um, a technique, that, a statistical technique we use for solving certain sorts of problems. And um, uh, Donald Knuth, who's one of the great computer scientists, Turing Award winner, um, credits von Neumann with developing the merge order algorithm, which is one of the earliest computer algorithms um, uh, written down on paper. Okay, there's many, many more things he did. He was also um, a brilliant linguist who is Hungarian. He grew up, if you read the the, the book, The Prisoner's Dilemma book, if you, he grew up in a household speaking a lot of different languages and at some remarkably young age, he could um, uh, trade jokes with his with his parents in, in all kinds of languages, Greek and um, English and whatever, even though he's Hungarian. And the other thing is he famously had a photographic memory. So as a party trick, his folks would show a telephone book, which I know you guys don't know what a telephone book is, but it's got tons of numbers in it. Show them a num uh, telephone book. He'd look at it for a few moments and then the party guests could go and interrogate uh, young John von Neumann about the, uh, the, the things in the book. All right, anyway, um, John von Neumann is definitely one of the titans of computer science, the absolute titans of computer science. Um, bit of a controversial character was at Princeton at the same time as Einstein, and they were very different characters. Uh, von Neumann would drive fast cars and was whip fast with jokes and uh, witty. Uh, Einstein was much uh, slower, if you like, much more moderate, and uh, they're obviously both in incredible intellectuals. With that, I think we'll finish. We're uh, right on uh, 12 o'clock. Thank you for the lecture. Any last questions? Um, if you want, we'll finish the lecture there, but if anyone has any last qu questions, I will um, finish up. All right, um, if you have any more questions. Oh, with respect to the lab test, I, the final de technical details aren't still aren't clear, at least they weren't when I started this lecture two hours ago. Um, I will post on Piazza before the end of tonight, um, or certainly before that you start your lab, I'll post precise details. But the basic idea is simple. 
Question one, you will have a repo. You'll be told exactly how to get that repo. You'll bring it into IntelliJ and then you write hello world. And then you'll have three more questions which are from your homework. That's what you need to know. And you're gonna get marked on that and you need to do it during the actual lab and you'll need to be communicating with your uh, tutors. And the exam itself is really supposed to be 90 minutes. You've got a one and a half hour lab. So 15 minutes to get ready, 90 minutes for the lab, 15 minutes at the end. Are you allowed internet access during the lab test? That's a great question, Linda. Very, very important question. Yes, you are. Okay. Now, traditionally, you you weren't. Okay. This is. Let me jump here to f full screen because this is this is important, folks. In this class, when we did a lab exam for the last seven years, the way it's worked is you go into a lab and it's like an exam. You don't get access to e to anything at all. Although you had the questions in advance, all the homework questions, so you knew that. Now you need because you're remote you're going to have to have access to the internet okay and we can't monitor you i'm not going to be sitting there looking over your shoulder okay but i want you to approach this thing with integrity okay so you can go and cheat if you wish and i will not be able to easily find out okay but i trust you and i need to be able to trust you if i can't trust you then it's game over for all of us okay so what's going to happen is you're going to get a set of questions and then you're honor bound it's on your honor okay that you go through that and do the right thing and work through um, the questions that you're given. Okay, can I check whether you whether you um, communicate with someone else? No, I can't check that. I just have to trust you. I have no choice with a COVID situation. I've got no choice but to put trust in you guys to do the right thing. So that's how it's going to work. Okay, now remember it's redeemable. So please try and do the right thing for your sake as well as mine. Okay, we're all going to be better for it if you do the right thing. The things are redeemable. So if you're really screwing stuff up, don't panic. You can get the marks redeemed. All right. So please take this th thing seriously. Um, we expect you to abide by that code of conduct that you signed off on, the pledge that you wrote right at the start of semester, and do the right thing. Can we check it? No, of course we can't. Okay, we're not in a situation where we can do that. All right. So good luck with that exam. Please do the right thing. Um, and if you have further questions, raise them on Piazza and before your lab, before the first lab tomorrow, I'll have very specific details about how to do it. Okay, have a great day. Have a great week.